So today we're going to continue on in our epic series. Over the past few weeks, we've gone through some really great stuff. In fact, we've, um, we're saying that we're getting through the whole Bible in a year, but we're only like halfway through Exodus so far. So we're going for quality, not quantity so far. Come on. That means y'all going to have to read a whole bunch next month, though. It's going to be on. It's going to be on as March is now here, believe it or not. So today, I think we're going to learn quite a bit about how the human mind works. Hopefully, we're going to learn a lot about ourselves and how we think. But most importantly, I think we're going to see how God relates to us in spite of our sin, in spite of our frailties, in spite of our shortcomings. We're going to talk a little bit about this concept of the old covenant and the new covenant and a little bit of the key verses that set it up. We actually experienced uh, a couple weeks ago when we talked about Abraham and how God promised him that he would give them this land. He promised him that he would be the father of many nations, that he would have children as the sand on the sea. And we saw in that particular message how God delivered on that promise. And we're still seeing it fulfilled, even in our own generation today. I hope that was an encouragement for you. If you happen to miss that particular message, you could go online to journeychurch.org, or you could download our app and watch any of the past messages. So I want to encourage you to do that, because we really got into this concept of God's promises and what the old covenant's about. We're going to reinforce that today. We're going to get a glimpse of how God saw the Jewish people and how he sees us. And I pray that it's an encouragement for you. So let's go to God this morning. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. What a blessing it is to be gathered together in your house this morning among other believers on this nice, cool Florida day. We pray that you uh, have already enjoyed the worship that's taken place here this morning. Lord, it's been our pleasure and honor to give to you of our finances as an act of obedience and worship. And as we dive into your word, would you use it to stir our hearts? Would you use it to change us? Would you use it to transform us? Would it get deep within us and pour out of us during the course of the week? In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. amen. So I truly believe if we can grasp the concepts for, from today, it's very key to our lives. If we can grasp these things and really put them into practice, as you'll see, it can be life transforming. So to set up where we're at today, we're going we're gonna to turn to Exodus chapter 19. So if you brought your Bibles with you or have your app, feel free to go ahead and open it up and find Exodus 19. We'll put some of these scriptures on the screen as well. Uh, last week, Pastor Brinson just did a brilliant job talking to us about how the is Israelites ended up leaving Egypt and they're going on their journey towards the promised land. And as Exodus 19 opens up, we really find ourselves at the foot of Mount Sinai, the meeting place with God. So they've reached this place. One of the promises is actually being fulfilled, that they're about to encounter God at the foot of this mountain. And that's kind of where this story picks up. Exodus 19.3 says, The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you out to myself. So God starts with a reminder to his people. He oftentimes has to do that in his word because we've got these built-in forgetters between our skull right here. Anybody like me? You forget stuff from time to time, right? We forget his goodness. We forget what he's done for us. So he starts this conversation that we're entering into by reminding them of what he's done for them. I removed you out of slavery. I took you from that place of bondage. I brought you here to the very foot of this mountain where I want to go down and be with you. I want to hang out with you. I want to enjoy you. I want you to enjoy me. This is where we find ourselves. But when life gets busy around us, when life is painful, we have trouble remembering those things. So I think what God's probably speaking to us today is a great reminder for both you and for me. He's saying to them, Remember what I did for you in the midst of the Egyptians. He says to you today, remember the joy of your salvation. Remember what your life was like before that. Remember what your life has been like after that. For those 16 of you who got baptized on Thursday night, remember what your baptism day was like and what it was all about. Remember how awesome it felt to come out of the waters of baptism and the newness of life and celebrate and feel clean and as white as snow knowing just how much God loves you. Remember how amazing it was the first time that you realized that when you pray that there's someone up there listening. And regardless of what Joy Behar says, it's pretty cool when he talks back to you on occasion too. Can I get an amen, right? 
I mean, to realize those things. Re remember when he opened the doors for you that you thought would never get opened. Remember when he shut doors for you and you were like, I can't believe he shut that door. I think everything's falling apart. No, he shut it for you on a reason and you came to realize that later that he did it to protect you because he cares for you and he loves you. Would you remember these kinds of things? Would you remember that he's your provider? Would you remember that he's your sustainer? Don't forget it because guess what? Like we heard earlier during that altar time, there's going to come a day where all of us are going to get some sort of call. It could be a medical call as his was, right? It could be a call about a relationship. It could be a call about a loved one. It could be a call into the office because they're going to give you a pink slip. You don't know what that call might be, but there's going to come some call that's going to happen. And how are you going to react in that, in that moment? In between services, somebody came up to me and they're like, man, I am so glad that you preached that because my wife just lost her job. He goes, but I could rejoice because I remember how he gave us jobs in the past. He's got our back. He cares for me. He loves me, but sometimes we're in the middle of it. It's hard to see those things, right? When we're in the middle of that waiting place between Egypt and the promised land, it could get a little bit difficult. So he's saying, remember how good it is to know him and know that he loves you. As we move on from this place, one of the things you'll notice about the promise that he gave to Abraham that I talked about earlier was it was an unconditional promise. He was going to do it regardless of anything. Now we're about to experience in just a moment a conditional promise. He's going to give the Israelite people a conditional promise. So how I, would, how I relate this in my geek mind to who I am and how I grow up, I'll give you a little bit of an example as as you grew up, maybe some of you played, how many of you played sports when you were growing up? You were on some kind of sports team. So I was just a geek, man. I played with the Atari and, you know, Commodore 64. And you guys are like, some of you young people are like, what is that? Go Google it. It was a lot of fun back in the day. You know, Pong, you know, come on. And come on. Donkey Kong, anybody remember? Come on, Jesus. If you, uh, all right, come on, yeah. That was my game. But So in school, they taught us this computing language called BASIC, and it was very BASIC. And one of the commands in BASIC was conditional. You, you had to set a condition so that if this occurs, then this will happen. So it was an if-then statement. So if someone clicks on this particular spot, then this will occur, right? Um, it was very important to the language, and a lot of life is like that. So a lot of life is conditional. A lot of scripture is actually conditional. If you will do this, then I will do that, right? So there's some things that... Uh, I didn't like about the learning of that kind of a statement. So there was this one time where I was programming. I was in there all day. I'm in there being the geek that I was, just typing away, programming away. And I learned that if you don't save your work and your dad goes in and turns off the circuit breaker, then you lose all your work. Come on, Jesus. Now, now you young people who are here, they got auto save now, man. They didn't have that back in the day. So like saves it for you automatically as you go along. Or this one truly was a revelation, sadly. Um, if I don't drink, then I don't get arrested. Hallelujah. You see, not every time I drank did I get arrested, but every time I got arrested, I was drinking, right? That might be a revelation for some of y'all in here today, right? So we do have a group on Friday nights that meet, a recovery group. Come on, Jesus. Some of us need to be there more than others. Amen. God bless you. So we're about to talk about this conditional promise. Exodus 19, 5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. You hear what he's saying? You shall be a kingdom of priests. But it, he's adding conditions there. If you'll obey my word, if you'll follow me. In fact, I would add a, a, a new statement to our basic programming language. One of the things was if, then, and, and then something would happen. So if this happens and this happens, then this will end up occurring, right? So he's introducing a little bit more complexity. If you will obey my voice and heed my covenant, you shall be X, right? He's telling them how to live. And sometimes before becoming a Christian, when he gave us rules that he wanted us to follow, I thought, dang, I don't want to be under rules. I don't want to do it. But what I realized is that he puts rules and boundaries before us because he loves us. He doesn't want us to get ourselves in trouble. And when we violate these basic principles of God's word is when we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. So he's telling them, 
I want you to be my representatives here on earth. You're a holy priesthood. I want you to go out there and declare the world my goodness and my glory. So he's standing at the foot of the mountain saying, I want to be with you. I'm going to be with you. I want you to be my people. You're a chosen possession, a special people. We'll revisit that concept because when we get to the new covenant and we get to Jesus and what he says about us, it's something very similar. But there's something we also need to see in there. I want to add even one more command into our basic programming language of Christianity. If then else. If then else. Where that comes in is if you obey my commands, then this blessing will occur else something else is going to happen. And there's a lot of things in God's word like that, right? There's the opposite of blessing that can occur. So if I gossip on the regular, then one day my friends are going to find out and then they're going to hate me, right? If I drink for me, then chances are one day I will get arrested. It's going to happen. I can almost guarantee it. I could see that as an inevitable outcome. If I entertain conversations with ladies or for you ladies who entertain conversations with gentlemen who are not your spouse, then one day you may find yourself divorced. Does that make sense to you? Remember, remember these things. Remember his goodness because there's going to be a day that that fine lady's going to be in front of you. Come on, Jesus, right? If you entertain that conversation, that's going to be a plant and ploy from the devil to try to steal your marriage and get you divorced. How are you going to react when that day comes? If I fail to manage my money God's way, as we were being taught by Don Wilson a little bit earlier, then guess what? You will find yourself in debt. You will find yourself in pain. You will find yourself in financial discourse and discord, right? But then why do we look at things like he talked about Malachi chapter 3 a little bit earlier, did he not? It says, test me in this. Go read Malachi chapter 3. There's another conditional blessing that's found in Malachi chapter 3. If you will do this, then I will bless you, else this will happen. Will we take God at his word in these areas of our lives? See, I don't know what your else is. I don't know what you're tempted to do. I don't know what that thing is that challenges you that's not in alignment with God's word, where you're finding yourself in sin, where you're finding yourself violating God's principles. Only you know that. But I would ask you right now, what's your else? What's that thing that you know if you continue on doing what you're doing, that else may occur someday soon, right? Or are you going to change? Are you going to submit it to him? Are you going to lay those things down at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, forgive me. So be honest with yourself this morning. Where's that deep, dark place that you might go if you forget to remember God's goodness? Would you remember him in the midst of that? See, here's how they reacted. Here's how we should react, but we don't want to do so just with our emotions. As you read on in Exodus 19, 7, it says, Moses came, calls all the elders and all the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. This is a good thing, is it not? Y'all aren't acting like it's a good thing from what I can see out there right now. This is a good thing, right? But there's also some nuances in there that we find in ourselves too. So what's happening here? At the end of every service, we say, man, if today's the day you need to dedicate your life to Jesus or maybe the day you need to rededicate your life to Jesus, would you come up here to the front? We would love to pray for you. And most of you in this room have done that at some point in your life. Yes, Lord, from this moment forward, I'm going to live for you. All that you have declared, I am going to do. And then like two weeks later, you're out there doing some other stuff that ain't what we're talking about. Is that anybody ever done it? Am I, I'm the only one? Oh my goodness, we are in trouble, right? You can hear what I'm saying. So this is, when I, when I said we're going to learn a little bit about human nature, that's what I'm talking about here. Because what we're going to see happen is the Jewish people go and say, God, we're going to do this. We're, we're on fire. We're going to live for you. And then all of a sudden, Moses ends up being called by God up to the top of the mountain And it's taken a little bit too long for their liking, and they find themselves worshiping something else. They quickly revert back to their idols. They quickly revert back to their old passions rather than worshiping this one true God who brought them out of darkness and into light. we got to understand this about human nature so that we can defeat it in our own lives. Can I get an amen to that one? Exodus 19.9. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud. 
that the people may hear when I speak to you and may also believe you forever. So he's going to come down in a cloud. He's going to do so in magnificent fashion, as we're going to read in just a moment, that the people might see this and be like, God is God. I am human. I need God. Lord, I'm here to worship you. Sadly, that doesn't totally occur. So again, we're learning something about ourselves. But what I want you to see here in the midst of it is God, from the time of the garden until today, has always wanted to be with us. He's always wanted to hang out with us. He's always wanted to walk with us and talk with us and enjoy being with us. But because of sin, he has to shroud himself in this cloud lest we encounter him and instantly die. The very fact that you're still alive says something about God's grace because at some point when I was talking about all this sin stuff, almost every one of you nodded and the ones who didn't are the ones who are really in trouble, right? All of us acknowledge that we have issues and challenges and we need God's help and the very fact that we're still here breathing and living is a demonstration of God's mercy and grace on our lives. So here, th this is just cool, better than any 4th of July fireworks you'll ever see, Exodus 19:16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud and a mountain and the very loud trumpet blast of God. All that the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke went up like a smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord calls Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses goes up. Now, I don't know about you, but if I witnessed this, I would have been like, I'm never turning from God, I'm never running from God, I'm whatever this is. Or at least I hope I would, right? At least I hope I would, because they saw all of this. And then, like I shared a little bit earlier, they got impatient, and they wanted to go about it on their own. So you've got to skip forward a little bit to Exodus chapter 32, but all the stories are interlinked in there. And what we see is Moses goes up, and he's going to be delivered the Ten Commandments, right? And he's going to come down, and he's going to deliver them to the people. But while he's up there communing with God, the people are getting restless, and they take the very thing that was to be a blessing for them, and they turn it into an idol. What do I mean by that? Um, if you read back in Exodus, one of the cool things that always trips me out about it is when they were getting ready to leave, God tells them to go ask the Egyptian people who were the ones who were keeping them in bondage and slavery to give them all their gold and silver. Now, I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard to get to borrow 20 bucks from a friend sometimes, right? I mean, like, hey, Mary Jo, can I borrow 20 bucks or not even borrow? Give me 20 bucks. You know, it's, it's hard to do that. So they walk up to their very enemies and say, hey, well, why don't you throw me some gold and silver before I go? And they give them all the gold and silver of the land. So they're walking out with all the riches of Egypt. And then now they find themselves at the foot of Mount Sinai with the spirit of the living God hovering over them. And they start taking what was to be a blessing from God and fashioning the gold into a golden calf. And then they start worshiping that calf, saying it's that thing that brought them out of Egypt instead of the God who's right there on the mountain before them, right? we got to remember. Lord, help us to remember your goodness, your kindness, all the things that we talked about earlier. So this gets to the depth and complexity and the strength of this thing called idols that could be at work in our life. And usually idols surround a few things, comfort, entertainment, security. These are the root idols that hide under the surfacey things. These are the ones that are really controlling your mind, your will, and your emotions if you're not careful. They're the ones that are trying to steal your glory from God. So what's comfort? Oh, instead of worshiping God and spending time with Him and coming to church and going out there and spending time in God's Word and spending time in prayer and going to small groups, I'm going to watch This Is Us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. See, or maybe for some it turns into, I know football or things are an easy thing to pick on, but let me tell you, some of you get more fired up and going out there and put green and teal on you worshiping God and you're sitting here worshiping God, uh, you know, you go to the Jaguars, you'd be getting buck wild out there with all that stuff. And then you come in here, you'd be like this while you worship. Hey, Jesus, hallelujah. <laughs> you're free to worship God in this place. Have fun, man. As long as you're not being a distraction to others. I don't know what color you'd paint yourself, maybe purple or something. I don't know. But you, you can come in here and enjoy God's presence and worship and be free. Some of us are more free worshiping stuff like that than we are the God of the universe. 
One of the biggest idols that we don't like to confront is finances and money. God speaks to us as he does, says, hey, you're supposed to give this amount. If you do this, I'll do it. But we want to hold on to it and say, we got a better way. So we work all day and all night and we try to do all these things and it seems like we're never getting ahead when if we just follow what God's word says, everything would work out and we'd be blessed and we'd be comfortable in it. None of you are ever guilty of that, are you or we, right? Don't we do these things that we don't even know why we do them? These idols are anything that wants to take first place in your life over God. We're trying to be comfortable, we're trying to entertain ourselves to death in our own generation. There's a variety and a multitude of things that we worship that you don't even consider it. We need to even consider our kids. Some of us worship our kids. You say, what do you mean, what do you worship our kids? We spend more time worrying about how we're going to cart them to and from soccer and football and all these things that, let me tell you, I pray some of your kids go on to be in the NFL, you know. But what about Wednesday night gathering together with the teens and worshiping God and teaching them something that will be eternal all the days of their life? Why don't we put a priority on those things? We forget about God sometimes in the midst of it. I sat with a guy in, in a counseling session not long ago, and his kids were about to leave. They were disconnected. They don't want anything to do with God at this stage. He had spent all his time trying to get them out there on the baseball field so that they could go out there and get a college scholarship. They don't even want to play baseball anymore, but they're not even connected to church because they spent all their time trying to play baseball, and now they're like disconnected and don't even know what to do. May we not get to that place, right? Keep your kids in the right place. Some of us, we worship our kids because they get all straight A's. And then if they get B's or C's, we get all disappointed and all out of shape and bent out of shape and all weird about it. Don't give them too much of your emphasis. Point them towards Christ and everything will work out all right. God will take care of them. We've got to let go of some of these things and let God get involved. God forbid you worship politics in our day and age. Come on, Jesus. All the while, God continues to speak to us, and he says, remember me. Remember me. God's anger burns hot over what he witnesses. Exodus 32, 7. And the Lord said to Moses, go down to your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. How sad is it? But it wasn't just them that does it. Doesn't most of modern day Christianity do the exact same thing? We stand up, yes, Lord, we're going to serve you. And then our weeks look like hell half the time, right? Lord, would you help all of us to remember and help put these things into practice so that we could image you well? So now he comes and he delivers them these Ten Commandments in just a second. It says, the first one, Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods before me. Why does he give us these commands? Again, I just want to remind you, because he loves you and doesn't want you to see you get messed up and, you know, in all kinds of trouble. He lays out for them all these commandments that they should put into practice. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff. Don't cheat on your wife. Don't kill anybody. He lays out these things, which are pretty much common sense, but let me tell you, apart from the Holy Spirit being at work in your life, are virtually impossible to keep. Have you ever found that to be true? I mean, I think I violated at least nine of the ten, you know, or something like that. I don't know, my mouth might be off, but I mean, it's so easy to go and fall into the things of the world apart from the Holy Spirit. So I said earlier that God not only wants to be with us, he wants to be in us to empower you by his Holy Spirit. He doesn't leave us defenseless so we can't succeed in this life when we move from the old covenant to the new covenant that's bought by none other than the blood of Jesus Christ. He says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, by the works of the law, no human being shall be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So we're not here saying you have to be perfect all the time. This, the, the law reveals our sin, but the only thing that can cover our sin is the blood of Jesus Christ, right? So Jesus said that he came not to abolish the law. He still wants us to live holy lives. He came to fulfill it and give us the power to do so ourselves. If we will only remember his goodness, if we'll remember his mercy and we'll put it into practice in our lives. Romans 3.21 tells us we need a righteousness that is apart from the law. That righteousness comes from none other than Jesus Christ himself. 
See, from the time of the garden until the time of now, God wants to be with you. I'll repeat what I said earlier. When you go to work, he wants to be there with you. It's not just when we come to church. When you sit down at the table for dinner with your family, he wants to be there with you. If you are so blessed to go walk out there and enjoy a time of this coolness and get to go enjoy a walk in the park, he wants to be there talking and communing with you. How amazing is that? And what makes it possible is the sacrifice that Jesus made. He overcame hell, death, and the grave. He's the one who can empower us to live the kind of life that we're talking about here. I want to bring it full circle before I close. See, the Lord gave Moses two tablets of stone. He brought them there, crushed them, had to remake them, right? He brings us these laws that we need to attempt to live by, this holy life. See, the law was given through Moses, but it says in Scripture, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is the cup of the new covenant that was brought in his blood. Why did he do all of this? If we read back in Exodus 19.5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey, obey my voice and keep my covenant, remember that conditional promise, you shall be a treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, right? That's his desire for those who follow him from the beginning until now, that you would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, but he realized that the condition wasn't working. We have no ability to complete the law on our own, so he sent an intermediary, an intercessor, one in our place on our behalf, that if we believe on him, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, look what happens in the New Testament. The condition is actually gone. If you look at 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I'm going to stop there and I'll read the rest in a moment. Realize that you are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer a slave to your old life and your old lifestyle. You no longer need to live in bondage to the things of the past. You need to receive your identity in Christ Jesus. Remember who you are. If they put that back up there for a second, remember who you are. You are a chosen people. See, my dad left me and rejected me. I never met him. He didn't want to take care of me. He didn't want to take care of my mom. He wasn't there for me, but I am a chosen person by God. God chose me. He loves me. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm no longer a slave. How important was this to the Jewish people? They were just in bondage. They could see their physical slavery. In our generation, we miss it. We're enslaved in our minds, and we don't even know it. And he's saying, you are free. You're no longer a slave. You're a royal priesthood. We're called to be a holy nation. The only way we can do that is by him and by the power of his blood. But holiness matters. We can't go out there living in our sin. It doesn't make any sense. Why does he do all this? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. This life is not about you and me as much as we want to think it is. It's about giving glory to the King of Kings, about giving glory to the God who saved us, about giving glory to the one who brings us out of darkness and into light. See, while we're here, we're called to be missionaries. We're called to go out there and share the good news with our very life. This is the purpose of our being, to declare the riches of his glory. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Thank you for letting me go a little bit long. Lord, you are good, you are gracious, you are more than kind, your mercy is everlasting. I thank you for extending it into my life. I thank you for bearing with me and putting up with me, for my frailties are many, my sin are many. Lord, I can't help but give you the glory. I can't help but remember and look back on all the things that you've done to bring us to where we find ourselves today. Are there still challenges? Are there still pains? Are there still difficulties and things I don't understand sure but Lord I remember how good you have been to me Lord you are gracious and merciful and Father I believe that many who are in this room find themselves in the same boat that you remember his goodness his kindness and his mercy but for some in this room today you're finding yourself between a rock and a hard place and God's brought you here for such a time as this your sin no matter however great or small it might seem 
God wants to do away with it. He wants to make you that holy priest that we're talking about. See, it's not my job as the pastor to be the priest. All of us are called to be ministers. All of us are called to be agents of reconciliation, of people who partner in sharing the good news of the gospel. It's a call on every one of our lives. So today, you've heard about God's goodness, his love, and how he wants to be with you and near you and hang out with you. And maybe for the first time, some of you are realizing that and saying, man, I want to surrender my life to God. I want to I want to serve him and live for him. And you want to have the same response that the Jewish people did that day. Lord, we, we serve you and live for you all the days of our life. For others of you, you are believers in Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secured. But you know today needs to be a day of rededication. You've been struggling with things. You've been pointing yourself maybe in a different direction. And you know today's the day that you need to come home. Today's the day that you truly need to say with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind, and you need God's power by the Holy Spirit to come inside you and say, yes, I'm going to live for him all the days of my life. You're going to rededicate your life today. So I don't want to do anything to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you. Nobody's looking around right now. So if that's you and you know you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God today, would you do me a favor and just hold your hand up really high so I know who I'm praying with? Is there anybody here today? I see your hand and yours. Thank you. And your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those who are raising their hand and your hand over there in the middle of that section. Thank you, God. Praise you, Father, that you're still moving, that you're still changing lives. Hey, again, I don't want to embarrass you, but there's something like when it said that they came and ran up to the Mount of, of, of uh, Mount Sinai, you know, there's something that just happens where when we start to come forward, God removes those things from our life. And I pray that he'll do that even now for you. If you raised your hand or didn't and wanted to, I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm going to just join hands with you and pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor and run out of your seat and come right up here to the front? Everybody around you is going to clap. They're going to be excited. Come on, sister. If that's you, come on up here to the front. God is good. Rejoice with them, Journey Church. Rejoice with them. Hallelujah. God bless you, sister. God bless you. Come on, come right over here. God bless you, sir. Come on up. Give them a little bit of glory. Come on. Glad you're here, man. God bless you. Stand right here. There's just some more. Come on. Father, we just come before you with these wonderful souls who have committed their life to you today, Lord God, whether they're dedicating their lives to you for the first time or rededicating. Lord, we just stand in awe of you and what you're doing and, and how you're changing us and transforming us. And we just all make a public declaration in unity with them today that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. Lord, we surrender our lives to you for the first time or anew today, saying, Lord, remove our sins, cover our sins, guide us, direct us, lead us, forgive us, equip us to be this holy nation that you're calling us to be. Equip us to go out there and live on mission. Equip us to go out there and share the good news of what you've done in our life. So Lord, we stand here with great joy with those who have come to the front. And Lord, we rejoice that you're continuing to save, that you're continuing to deliver, that that you're continuing to set free. Father, would we leave this place and go about our business remembering that our job is to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into this wonderful light. We love you. We praise you. We give you glory today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you guys so much for being here. If you're new, come on up and say hello. I'd love to meet you. Go have a great week. If you want a sticker, next step, sign up for that health seminar all the great stuff that's going on. Thank you for being here. Enjoy your day.